Good morning, friends. Today I'm here to talk about all the books that I've been reading in the past few months. I haven't done one of these bookish updates in a while. I think the last time I did was April. So I'm going to share what I've read in May, June, and the beginning of July, which is this stack of 11 books, and they were some pretty great ones. So I'm super pumped to share these with you today. So I am recording on a new camera and I'm not sure how that's going to go. It's definitely not the best camera on the market and I know the audio is pretty bad so I've got my audio set up here and I'm just really hoping that this is going to work because I did invest a little bit of money in that camera because I was tired of filming on my phone like an amateur, which I still am an amateur but I'm trying not to be. Anyways, so I'm going to talk about the first five books as a group because these are the second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth books of the Anne of Green Gables series which my husband and I have been reading together this summer and I am absolutely in love with this series like full stop and so is my husband which is very surprising for both of us. Yeah we just keep falling deeper and deeper in love with Anne and Gilbert and Prince Edward Island and the nautical landscapes of their life and just the wholesome beauty, the attention to the simple pleasures of life that are found in these books. And I really appreciate how every book in this series, to be clear, we haven't finished the series yet. There are eight books in total. So we've, we've read one to six and we're hoping to finish seven and eight off this summer. But what I really love about this series is that each book kind of represents a new era in Anne's life. So for example, Anne of Green Gables, which is the first and most well-known of these classics, kind of chronicles her, her early girlhood when she comes to Green Gables, when she begins her life with Matthew and Marilla and her good friends Diana and Gilbert and others. The second book, Anne of Avonlea, completes her girlhood but also kind of chronicles her early teaching years as a school teacher at the Avonlea schoolhouse. Book three, Anne of the Island, chronicles her university years when she goes to Queens and to Redmond to study, and also her dating and engagement years. Spoiler alert, she does date a young man for a while who she does not get engaged to because she realizes that she is, after all, in love with Gilbert Blythe after all this time. And then book four, Anne of Windy Poplars, Anne moves away to a different town on the island and she serves as a principal at a school there. So this book kind of chronicles her experiences as, as principal, but also the relationships that she builds in that town. She lives in a grand old house with some old widows and a really interesting housekeeper and she makes all kinds of friends as usual. Throughout book four, we see her corresponding with Gilbert, her fiance, who is away studying to be a doctor. So there is that element of a love story weaved throughout this book as well. For book five, Anne's House of Dreams, we have Gilbert and Anne get married finally, which is so, so happy. And I love that scene and I loved reading about that. Um, and then they move off and Gilbert begins his practice as a doctor and Anne moves into the little house of her dreams, which is on the seashore. There's a big lighthouse and an old ship captain. This book I find has like the most interesting characters out of all of them, the most interesting side characters that is, and it's really lovely to watch Anne and Gilbert as a couple make friends and have influence in other people's lives and just see where that goes. This is also the book where Anne becomes a mother for the first time. And then book number six, Anne of Ingleside. So in that book, her and Gilbert are happily married and they have six kids. Spoiler alert, they have a lot of kids. In this book, Montgomery is really allowing us to get to know all of Anne's kids. Um, so yeah, Anne is the thread throughout the whole book. She's present in every chapter as their mother. That's kind of all we see of her is the role of kind of mother and wife. And we see her through the eyes of her kids as they go through all the good and bad experiences of childhood. Anyways, all five of these books are wonderful. They warmed my heart. Oh, I hope to read through this entire series many, many times before I die, and my husband and I already are like planning a trip out to PEI one of these years. We want to drive out there, spend a lot of time on the island, and hopefully read the entire series over the course of that journey and trip. The next book that I read is Surprised by Joy by C.S. Lewis, and I'm not going to say too, too much about this book because I did make a whole separate video about it because I loved it that much. It's really, really great as all of C.S. Lewis's works are. But this book is the closest that we have to an autobiography of Lewis. We know so much about his life because of this book. It offers fascinating insights into his creative mind and his spiritual and intellectual journeys. The main theme of the book is Lewis's pursuit of 
joy, which he experienced first as a young boy as he was getting lost in his imagination and in fairy tales. It chronicles Lewis's descent into atheism and then his coming of age years as he's in school, as he's becoming a young man. It pays close attention to his intellectual journey and the friends and the arguments and the experiences that actually led him back to Christianity as a really grudging, reluctant convert. The main thing about this book for me, I think, is this concept of joy because I have experienced that in my learning, in my reading over the years, and it's like the most indescribable feeling ever. Once you feel it, you're just like, I want to feel that again because it just, life is suddenly this big. Life is suddenly infinite. And that feeling can be found in so much more than just literature and study. I think it's found in different things for different people, but I think its source is always the same. And Lewis discovers that source. But I think the true source of this feeling is one thing, one person, and all of our experiences of this feeling before we come to know that person are just glimmers of the real thing. We can never really experience it fully. We can't experience it in a lasting way until we find the real thing. If you've experienced the sublime sensation that Lewis chased for years before finding it again in Christ, this inexplicably pleasurable and hopeful phenomenon that Lewis, I think, rightly labels joy, then read this book. It really is a delight to find out that others are in search of this feeling too, and that joy is really real, and it can be lasting, and we can find it again, and we can have it. The next book that I read, I actually don't have a hard copy of it because I read it digitally. It was The Final Pagan Generation by Edward Watts, and this was a history book. I read this book as a research assignment for my professor who is writing a book on secularization and sacred social order. I am his assistant, so he gets me to read books and take notes and extrapolate information for him. Anyways, this book describes the shifting social and religious landscape of the Roman Empire around the 4th century and recounts the fascinating story of the lives and fortunes of the last Romans born before the Emperor Constantine converted to Christianity. So this is an academic work, and I wouldn't recommend it unless you plan to write a paper or have a very specific interest in the Christianization of the Roman Empire. The next book that I read is Knowing What We Know, The Transmission of Knowledge from Ancient Wisdom to Modern Magic by Simon Winchester. So I actually picked up this book in Montreal because it promised to explore book and print culture as it relates to the transmission of knowledge. This book didn't disappoint, actually. It was pretty good. It is very thick with intellectual history, ranging from the educational systems of various ancient cultures to the modern phenomenon of artificial intelligence. The author explores how humans have attained, stored, transmitted, translated, and disseminated knowledge over the course of human history. Um, yeah, this book is no light read. It's quite dense, it's very historical, but it serves its purpose really well. It does what it says it will do. And it really was impossible to set it down without having, and I set it down many times because I could only read it in small chunks, but it was impossible to set this book down without having picked up a plethora of new facts and anecdotes about human learning and understanding. If you're interested in intellectual history, this is a great book for you. I actually forgot to pull this one out, but this is The Book Thief by Marcus Zusak. This book probably doesn't need a ton of explanation. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, but I have to say that I think this is the most charming and haunting novel of our century. I fell in love with The Book Thief many, many years ago when I first watched the movie, and since then I've read through the book several times, and I actually make a point of watching the movie like at least once a year. I've rewatched it so many times because it's just my favorite. It moves me every time. It makes me cry every time. A girl in love with words, the thief of tomes, a yellow-haired boy in love with the book thief, a Jew brought back to life by words and stories, a twisted landscape of tragedy and fate and miracles, all narrated by death. That is my little summary that I hope convinces you to read this book. It's really, really honestly great. And I will forever mourn young Rudy Steiner and cherish the soul of Liesl Memminger, who is definitely a kindred spirit, and I will return to the book thief time and time again. If you haven't read this book, I recommend that you do it in winter. It is a very wintry book, thematically, and yeah, a lot of it is set in winter as well. All right, the next book I read was Deeper, Real Change for Real Sinners by Dane Ortland. I read this book as part of my daily devotional ritual. Dane Ortland is a reformed pastor and writer, he has the uncanny ability to communicate the beauty and the love of Christ in a way that leaves you longing to know Christ better. Ortland makes the case that sanctification, which is the process of becoming more like Christ, 
does not happen by your doing better or becoming better, but by going deeper into the gospel and letting its truths wash over you. The true Christian life is not about how well you stick to your devotional schedule or how faithfully you attend church or how convincingly you play the role of Christian in the world. It's actually about how well you understand, believe, and live out the doctrines of Jesus Christ that are found in scripture. This book served as a very timely and welcome reminder for me to be in the word more often and to trust Christ's work not my own, with greater fervor. So this is an excellent, excellent book for Christians and for those who are maybe just interested in getting to know who Christ is and what it means to be a Christian. Then I read Faust Part 1 by Goethe. By Goethe. I have been dying to read Faust ever since I listened to the Hardcore Literature's podcast episode on this great work. I realized then that this play could serve as a huge inspiration for my current novel, Project Abner, and indeed it did. So I actually generally gravitate toward prose writing before I pick up poetry or plays. I think a lot of people struggle with that, but I found Gota's poetic play to be very accessible, profound, and even comical, though it is a tragedy. So if you're eager to get into classic poetry, but like me, you just don't know where to start and you feel intimidated by the complexity and ethereality of many of the great poems, then I think Faust Part 1 is actually a great place for you to start. It was a great place for me, so this is just the poem to begin your journey into classical poetry. It really sucked me in, and I was able to follow the plot line and tap into the nuances and deeper meaning of the poetry quite easily. So I really look forward to tackling part two this coming autumn. All right, then we have The Idiot by Fyodor Dostoevsky. So yes, I actually have been keeping up with my Year of Dostoevsky resolution, though admittedly it's been at a slower pace than I first intended. To be perfectly honest, I lost much of my momentum towards reading all of Dostoevsky's work once the spring and summer came around. The frigid Russian nights and the bleak plights of the Russian workers and nobility just lost their appeal for the time being. But I do hope to pick up my Dostoevsky reading again this autumn and this fall. I think then I'll be able to kind of resync my teeth into the, his works. And I have worked through a good portion of them already this year, but I still have a few of his larger novels especially to tackle. And I will get to them. I, I really do intend to get to them. Anyways, I did manage to actually listen to The Idiot as an audiobook, which made it a lot more bearable and a lot more interesting because whoever narrated it was phenomenal. Though it did take me three months to complete it because I kept running out of Spotify listening hours and I'm too cheap to pay for more. So this novel's premise is fascinating and very well played out. So you have The Idiot, or Prince Mishkin, he arrives back in Russia after a holiday recovering from mental illness in southern Europe. And then he finds himself tossed about in Russian society due to his naivety and his inherent good-heartedness. The satire is palpable. Poor Prince Mishkin is so honest and pure-intentioned that the Russians find him unbelievable and either suspect him of being a con man or find him stupid enough to take advantage of. So Prince Mishkin finds himself entangled in a love triangle with two wild and undecided ladies seemingly mad for his innocent affections, which actually leads to the poor fellow's downfall. There's a lot more to it that was a very simplistic summary of, of the book's plot and premise because there is so much to unpack in The Idiot, and I just, I highly recommend that you discover that for yourself. I sadly do not have the time or ability to do a full analysis of this book right now, but I do highly recommend that you go and check it out, give it a read yourself, or listen to the audiobook on Spotify. All right, and then finally I have The Nine Tailors by Dorothy L. Sayers. This is a mystery novel, which is a very unusual choice for me, and probably because it wasn't really a choice, as I have to teach this book to my students this coming fall. So I figured I'd better read it and know what I'm talking about. However, I was actually very pleasantly surprised at how intricate the mystery and how compelling the plotline Dorothy Sayers transcribes in this rather long mystery novel. So what I knew of Sayers before picking up The Nine Tailors was that she was a friend and colleague of C.S. Lewis, and she was a proponent of classical education, having published The Lost Tools of Learning, which is a great essay, in 1947. But as it turns out, she was also a brilliant mystery novelist, and she had a very keen understanding of British culture and tradition which she weaves brilliantly through her stories. In this book in particular, she really gets into small town British life in the 40s and the 50s with particular attention to bell ringing and bell culture and church culture, which I never even knew was such a big deal, but 
the ringing of bells in the local church was like really really significant to the locals for various reasons and that is part of this story here anyways i actually highly recommend this particular novel to everyone and I look forward to reading more of Sayer's works as I begin my journey as a classical educator. I'm sure I will come in contact with her again sometime soon. Oopsie, my bookmarks. Anyways, those are the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and then 13 books that I've been reading for the past few months. And I am currently reading three more. My husband and I are reading The Fellowship of the Ring together. I'm reading Little Women, and I'm also listening to... The Adventures of Robin Hood. So I've got three other classics on the go, which brings me to, I think, book 42 for the year, which is, I think, a, a good amount of books for half a year's worth of reading. And hopefully I can add another 40 to that list by the end of the year. And I look forward to sharing the rest of those with you all. So thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed. I hope you took away some book recs and I will see you again soon.